Hi, and welcome to Relationships for Readiness, the Military Families Learning Network's 2019 virtual conference. I'm your host, Bob Birch. So great to have you along today as we get ready for our second session of the day, Collaboration Across Boundaries with Russ Linden. So happy to have you along to talk about the family readiness system. Uh, a few things I want to remind you of before we get started with today's session. One is I invite you to use our Idea Catcher journal. The Idea Catcher journal was uh, prepared uh, to help you kind of uh, deepen your experience in this conference, Relationships for Readiness. You can download it on the Military Families Learning Network's page at militaryfamilieslearningnetwork.org slash VC 2019 that the direct links are right there in the chat for you. Uh, if you haven't found the chat yet, you can find that by mousing over the bottom center of the screen, your Zoom screen, and choosing the chat icon that will open up there. Type where it says type message here in order to share your comments and questions and just make sure that you're posting to all panelists and attendees. You'll see who you're posting to by looking at the gray box right above type message here. That'll show you you uh, who you're posting to you click the gray box to change it to all panelists and attendees if it's not already selected uh, when you do use the idea care catcher journal please share them with us uh, snap a picture of your doodles and tweet them uh, to at milfamln to share and use the hashtag mflnvc we've had a few people doing that already it's awesome to see your doodles we'd like to see more and, and learn from each other so let's get started with our second session of the day, collaboration across boundaries. We know that if we're gonna work in the family readiness system, it's all about working together and combining our resources in order to provide the best possible service for military service members and their families. But how do we do it, right? So we can get connected, we can know we wanna to work together, but how do we collaborate? How do we collaborate successfully? That's what our next presenter is here to talk about. Russ Linden is a management educator and author who specializes in organizational performance and change. His current teaching and consulting interests include collaboration, the human side of change, strategic thinking and acting, developing an agile culture and individual and organizational resilience. He spent many years uh, working on this idea of collaboration and how we do it successfully, and we're so honored to have him as our presenter today. Please help me welcome. Excited about this webinar and this conference. To put it simply, collaboration has been my passion for over 30 years. During that time, I've become more aware of the many reasons why collaboration can be difficult. And we're gonna discuss those reasons today. But I've also been continually impressed by the potential and the power of collaboration. You know, there's an old African proverb that says, if you wanna go fast, go alone. But if you wanna go far, go together. That's the promise of collaboration. In terms of our family readiness system, it's clear to me that it makes much more sense for the hundreds of service providers working with military families to find ways to, quote, go together, to share information, to collaborate, rather than to go alone. And it's clear that the military families will gain a huge amount if we can make that happen. So let's get started. And I'm trying to figure out why I'm not getting to the next slide. Thank you. Some objectives. Want to understand what collaboration means and why it's important. We're going to learn about six key factors, elements that you can keep in mind whenever you're trying to collaborate to see if you're on target. And we're going to identify some characteristics, six characteristics of collaborative leaders. And in addition, while it's not shown on the slide, I'm eager for you to assess yourself when we get to the collaborative leadership phase and try to figure out where you're strong and where you're weak. Why collaborate? Well, there are lots of reasons. This is just a starter list. In terms of the third bullet, I think that's especially relevant for the family readiness system. To give an integrated response to customers, three of our examples today are gonna to refer to agencies trying to do just that, working with shared customers, trying to give them one response, not several. 
to make it easier for customers to get what they need in one place rather than just going having to shop around to several providers. Next slide. Um, yes, this is really, <laughs> uh, unfortunately, a real critter. And it's the winner of the Not My Job Award given annually by the Arizona Department of Transportation. Um, kind of um, difficult to look at. This is not the mindset we're talking about, folks. Now, the folks lining the road might have been efficient. They didn't want to stop for anything. But that's not what we mean when we talk about collaboration. On the other hand, Here's a great example of a running back in football, and if you're not into football, don't worry, you'll get it, who exactly breakout game, gained over 150 yards, he scored four TDs. Uh, if you're not a football fan, that's an enormous kind of game. But when the media went to interview him naturally, they wanted to shove a mic in his face, and he said, sure, you can interview me, but he said, only if you first bring those five huge linemen who are working their butts off, open the holes for me so that I could gain all those yards. You're going to have to introduce all of us together. Well, the media folks, their, their draws dropped. They were amazed. Whoever says that, right? But the linemen were delighted. This running back had a truly collaborative mindset. On this next slide, we're going to get some other thoughts about what it means to have a collaborative mindset. This comes from the CEO of Apple, Tim Cook who has done a lot of long and deep thinking about this very topic. Let's show the video. Or in terms of what you think will produce effective collaboration and what's your role as CEO in, in fostering that kind of collaboration? You look for, for people that uh, uh, are not political, people that are not bureau, uh, bureaucrats, People that really don't care who gets credit. People that are, can privately celebrate the achievement, but not care if their name is the one in the lights. Uh, you know, that, that there, are other, there are greater reasons to do things. You look for wicked smart people. You look for people who appreciate different points of view. Uh, you look for people that care enough that they have an idea at 11 at night and they want to call and talk to you about it uh, because they're so excited about it and they want to push the idea further and that they believe that somebody can help them push the idea another step instead of them doing everything themselves. The, the reason Apple is special is that we focus on hardware, software, and services. And the magic happens where those three come together. And so it's unlikely that somebody that's focused on one of those in and of themselves can come up with magic. And so you want people collaborating uh, in such a way that you can produce these things that can't be produced otherwise. And you want people to believe in that. What quality? So if we can go back a second, back a slide. Yeah. Um, Tim Cook shared a lot of things in that minute plus. I just want to emphasize a few. He says, when we're talking about a collaborative mindset, you want people who don't give a darn who gets the credit. You want people, as he ended, saying you need diverse points of view, people who can see broader than their one area. And we want people who seeks who seek other input, even if it means a phone call at midnight. <laughs> OK, so on the next slide, we're going to take a look at the first of four case studies. Each of these cases has at least one thing in common with what we want for the family readiness system. Namely, they each involve two or more organizations serving the same customers and trying to share information and collaborate to improve uh, services to those customers. This first one is called Service First. It's been going on since 1992, long time. The collaboration involves the US Forest Service and the Bureau of Land Management, large federal agencies. Now they often manage lands adjacent to each other, serving many of the same customers. Before the collaboration started, people wanting to hike or camp or fish 
or get a permit would go to one of the agency's offices, but sometimes they went to the wrong office. They didn't know who managed that particular land. And the office they went to, which was the wrong one, couldn't help the customer because those offices weren't collaborating. One couldn't tell you about what the other office provided. That's all changed. Today, they're sharing staff, they're providing permits, they're giving information about each other's operations. And the idea of one-stop shopping, that is no wrong door, saves the customer a lot of uh, frustration, makes it more convenient. And the public looks and says, well, that's how government ought to work. Uh, as though it's easy. <laughs> Let's go to the next slide. It took a lot of effort to help staff figure out how to do that. Slide. What helped them? Well, for one thing, they didn't pretend they were going to change the world. They started in a few areas where the line managers worked together and fostered relationships, as you can see in the second bullet. They learned over time that the staff in each agency had to become, quote, bilingual. What is that about? It means learning about each other's cultures, each other's procedures, their unwritten rules, their language. That's a huge part of collaboration. They realized that there wasn't a one size fits all. They had to let each region and each district figure out what to do. Interestingly, and I worked on this project, the headquarters didn't make a lot of these decisions because the folks on the ground were kind of worried that, you know, God forbid, the folks in Washington will come in and screw things up. That was the perception on the ground. So they didn't share area. Well, that's one example. Here's a very different one. Some of you in the DOD may be familiar with this. IADS stands for Integrated Air Defense System. IADS is a virtual team made up of professionals from many of the 17 intelligence agencies. It includes analysts and managers. The analysts work together to analyze the air defense systems of countries that can pose a threat to our nation. Now, before I had started, one intelligence agency would produce a report on a particular aspect of another country's air defense system. But if a customer, say a military officer, wanted to know how that country's entire air defense worked, the customer had to shop around. One agency could report on just what is studied, maybe radar or surface-to-air missiles, but nobody integrated these various pieces of analysis for the customer. As one analyst I interviewed put it, we customers have to, we get different parts of a jigsaw puzzle and we have to put it together, not what they needed. I had changed all of that. Now there's a team of managers that identifies the key countries to be studied and then they form a virtual team, analysts from several different agencies who do a study on what the customer needs. The analysts do the research and might run, write one report, not several, answering all that customer's questions. If we go to the next slide, you'll see a graphic showing you uh, visually how this works. In a sense, you could say the coordinating group sets the table. They tee things up. Who are the priority countries? Which agencies should be working on this, et cetera? And then this analyst group does the actual work on a given country for a given customer. And then back to the coordinating group, you see the final bullet there. The coordinating group does a final review of the analyst's work for quality and for accountability. Like I said, with the first um, example, service first, this looks easy, but believe me, it wasn't. Lots of lots of issues came across. For one thing, control. Lots of managers want and need control. That's not necessarily a bad thing. It's an it's a very natural thing. Some managers worried they would lose control of the staff who worked on these virtual teams. So Ms. Dempsey emphasized that managers could pull their own staff. What about from the staff's point of view? They were excited, but they worried that their work on an IADS virtual team might not count in their annual performance evaluation. You know the phrase, out of sight, out of mind. Dempsey assured the staff on the analyst teams that the coordinating group would share their assessment of the staff members' reports with the analyst supervisors. In other words, this would count toward their annual appraisal. And finally, competing requirements. The staff were excited to work on these virtual teams, but sometimes they'd be pulled back for something else for their home office. The coordinating group handles this by having a continually developed bench 
That is to say, a number of people with deep expertise in the same areas. So if so-and-so is pulled off a team, there are other people who can replace that person on that analyst's team. And in terms of critical success factors, that structure was important. Again, relationships were critical. But something we haven't talked about yet, the IADS leaders found good answers to the WIIFM question. Some of you know that acronym. What's in it for me? Now, obviously, that can seem selfish, and frankly, it sometimes is. But it's also a very human concern. Think of it this way. What's in it for me to work on this project, which is not part of my regular work, when I have other priorities and my manager is demanding other things from me? But the analyst, one very smart answer was that working with intelligent people who do similar work on important tasks, you're going to learn from each other. And that was very rewarding. The managers wondered how they were going to be able to collaborate and work on these issues and still meet the needs of their customers. And the answer to them was, when you're collaborating, that's one of your customers' highest expectations. And if you do that right, senior people in DOD are going to be delighted. IADS continues to work. It's a great example of collaboration with people who work miles and even hundreds of miles apart. So this is not primarily a session about theory, folks, but I will give you one model to consider. It's called the S-curve. This curve represents how many collaborative initiatives work. If you look at the bottom horizontal curve, that reflects inputs, effort, time, technology, ideas. And then the vertical axis on the left, that represents outputs or performance. Now, as you can see from this visual, at the start of an initiative, the bottom of the S, it's going right. There's more inputs, but there's nothing going up. That is, performance hasn't improved yet. That's very natural. That's because there's a lot to do at the beginning of a collaborative team. The team has to form. It has to develop trust. Those things don't necessarily immediately translate into performance. As we go further to the right, you can see the S-curve starts to move up. Performance is picking up. For example, with IADS, a few virtual teams formed. They got trained. They worked on their first product. But a lot of the other teams were sitting on the sidelines, and I observed this as well, watching and wondering. So there wasn't a huge effort at the beginning. A few got started, a few early starters, and the rest were watching. Well, most of those early efforts produced successful reports, delivered happy customers, and the word started to spread. After that, other teams got going, and that S-curve started to move up. Overall, performance was really great. But again, like many initiatives, the S-curve. There's more inputs, but there's not a lot of moving upward. Again, very natural. What happens? Some people get tired. Sometimes the original leaders move away and have other priorities. A lot of reasons why this is a natural phase. What to do? Well, at this point, some teams bring on new staff members who bring fresh energy, new ideas, fresh eyes, as they say. Or a team might develop a new approach to doing their work or develop a new product. And that can become the start of a new S-curve. The reason I'm telling you this, I often show this S-curve to collaborative teams at the beginning to help them see that they need to be patient. I tell them to understand the importance of investing in relationships, developing a game plan, discussions. If we invest at the beginning, over time, that S-curve will play out. We'll be delighted. Bob, it's yours. Thanks, for us. So those were awesome examples of collaboration, and we're really interested in what comments or questions you have about these examples. So please share those in the chat. You can access the chat window by mousing over the bottom of the screen and clicking the chat icon. What questions and, and comments do you have about the examples? Russ, I'm, you know, what stuck out to me was uh, both in the Bureau of Land Management example and the IADS example, um, you mentioned relationships. How important are those relationships to collaboration? Absolutely. Well, I said the second example was especially challenging because these folks don't work in the same offices. That was the whole idea, get people from across the Intel community to work together. That's especially hard to form relationships 
how did we manage that? I was on uh, one of the training teams that worked on the project. We developed a ground rule. Before they start working virtually, they have to meet face to face. So we brought them to a federal agency that does a lot of management training. And these teams came, groups of 10 and 12, and they spent three or four days together. They were using the software, they were practicing how they would work together, but there was also a lot of team building. And as we all know, team building happens often in informal ways, over a drink, during a break, uh, going out and exercising together. The relationships were almost as important as the quality of the work they did because they had to trust each other since they weren't sitting in the same offices. Great question, Bob. So we'll give a moment more in case anyone else has other questions or comments that you want to put into the chat. We really want this to be a conversation, so please uh, post your questions. Uh, I'm curious, Russ, in this example, you, uh, you said they had a great uh, WIIFM. Um, can you share what it was or why it was uh, so effective? Well, again, for the, uh, for the analysts, they were used to working in isolation, Bob. A lot of analysts, frankly, are introverts. So that's fine. Most government is, it turns out. Um, but they love to learn. It's fine for them to do their own work, but they love to be around other smart people. Tim Cook talked about that in his Apple example. So one of the benefits, one of the answers to the WIFM question for the analysts was getting to know other really bright people who maybe had different perspectives when they worked with the same issues. Sometimes those folks develop relationships, and this IADS example started back in the 90s that have continued, continued 20, 25 years later. That was an example of a WIFM for the analysts. For the managers, the WIFM, the answer to what's in it for me, was to demonstrate that they could collaborate for senior military leaders who had no interest in what we sometimes call silos, people who only work in their own little area. Kind of like that first graphic, Bob, with the uh, that poor critter who got run over by the folks lining the road. That was a silo mentality. Folks in DOD have been expected since the mid-80s to work across the various services, across the various units. Thanks, Russ. There are a couple of questions uh, from the chat. Sarah's uh, asking, what tips do you have for learning about other organizational cultures as you start on a collaborative path? That's another wonderful question. One of the things I've learned in working with government and other organizations for over 30 some years is that culture often involves some unwritten rules. <laughs> I remember the first time I worked in a government agency, I found out some of the rules that were never written when I broke them. Nobody bothers to tell you all the time. That's not part of the orientation. So one of the things I've learned is working with people in different cultures is to say, tell me how things work here. What do you mean, Russ? Well, like when something works well, what were some of the keys? And when something falls flat here, what usually gets in the way? Asking those kind of very concrete questions often helps us learn about what the attitudes and values and ways of doing things are especially when we ask what doesn't work here, and you'll learn a lot about what to avoid. So these are, again, often unwritten rules, but you can flesh them out, especially if you show a real air of, of uh, curiosity. Thanks, Russ. Uh, Vicky's just sharing that the idea that it takes uh, a while for the performance to peak uh, is interesting. Oftentimes, there's a need for a quick resolution or a demonstration of change. Yeah, would that we always had the time to go through the trust building process. Um, all of us have been given, you know, sort of drop everything and do it yesterday kinds of taskers. Um, I think the thing to do is be realistic. I sometimes say as a facilitator of these teams, folks, we really need two or three weeks to get together, but we have about five minutes. <laughs> so what we'll sometimes do at the beginning of a new team, especially when the people don't know each other, is I'll ask people to go around the table and not give us their long biography. We don't have time for that, but to tell us two or three things, namely what skills or experience or knowledge do you have relevant to the task that this team's been given? What skills, experience, or knowledge do you have relevant to this task? And I'll tell people, you have two minutes, go. And it's a way to learn not only what bring, people bring to the table, but how to play to each other's strengths. Playing to each other's strengths, and we'll see this in a later case, 
is one of the quickest ways to kind That's of awesome. jumpstart. Thanks for that, team. Russ. Um, thanks for your questions and comments. Please keep them coming throughout Russ's presentation, and I'll let you I'll let you move on, Russ. Great. Thank you, Bob. But thank you, folks, for the great questions. Um, we've talked about collaboration. What do I mean by it? What do you folks mean by it? I'll give you my working definition. It's what you see. I'm talking about people from different groups or organizations with a shared goal, that's critical, contributing from their strengths, I just mentioned that, and importantly, and sometimes very difficult, sharing ownership for the final product or service. Why is that difficult? Well, look, folks, I'm sure everybody in this conference is smart and experienced. It's not hard to get people to share ownership when things work. But what about when things don't work? Aha, <laughs> people run for the exits, right? How do we make sure we're committed to this? However it turns out, we're committed to each other. However it turns out, when people see that, when they sense that, they're much more willing to commit to a collaborative experience. So here's another case study, folks. And of the probably four cases that we'll have time to talk about today, I think this is the one that may come closest to family readiness system. This is about Montgomery County, Maryland. As you can see, 1999. Of the collaborative projects I've studied, this has been one of the most challenging. They started with 39 agencies. There are now over 50 trying to collaborate around services helping young kids, typically one to five, ages one to five. They had been working each agency with young kids and their parents, but it had always been separate, kind of like the IADS example. In this case, senior officials of three organizations led the effort. Montgomery County Schools Assistant Superintendent, Montgomery County Health and Human Services Director, and a nonprofit called the Collaboration Council, a local nonprofit that helps organizations learn how to work together, how to collaborate. They wrote an MOU, a Memo of Understanding. It was incredibly important at the time. The partner organizations signed it, but they didn't just sign it. They talked about it and they worked according to what that MOU said. This MOU, the first of its kind anywhere in Maryland, gave this collaboration a lot, a lot of street cred, a lot of power. It showed Peter. The MOU briefly defined expectations. What is each of these 39 now 50 agencies? What's their role? What's their responsibility? What's the process for collaborating? One of the first things they did, and it was one of the biggies, they hired a full-time coordinator who had a dual appointment, meaning she uh, happened to be a she at the time, reported to both the schools and health and human services. Unusual, but really powerful, because that was another a symbol that both of those two agencies were all in. And it also gave that coordinator the power, the ability to get information and access to important people in big bureaucracies. Um, you see the second to last bullet, eight collaboration principles. I wish we had time to go through those, although I, I assume everybody has access to the PowerPoint when they want it. But I'll just uh, re report on two of those principles now because they were really important. One of those principles says, recognize the partner's interdependence and at the same time, respect each partner's autonomy. That was useful because, as I said, these agencies were worried about loss of control. They were used to having control, doing their own thing. This says we're going to allow you to have some control, some autonomy, but we're also committed to working together. And the other principle I'll report on now says replicate programs only when they show measurable outcomes, only when they show measurable outcomes. This was a signal that the partners were committed to high quality high standards. If a program they were working on didn't demonstrate success, it would either be changed or it would be dropped. Again, like all collaborations, there were challenges. Control and autonomy, I just mentioned that. Keeping the senior leaders' attention. The senior leaders were very concerned and really wanted this to work, but several of them left for various reasons, and some of them were replaced by people who weren't as committed to the collaborative. The electronic information system. One of the great successes was also a challenge. Anyone who's worked on software knows that these things get complicated, especially when you require exchanging information that is privileged, that's sensitive, that's about clients. So there were enormous number of issues the attorneys had to work out, a lot of trust that had to be built, and a lot more memos of understanding. In addition, one of the most classic issues on any collaboration, moving from my client 
to our client. They were used to working by themselves. That was that need for autonomy. They had to find some way to embrace the idea that these are now shared clients, that we have the trust and respect in each other, that we can combine information, write joint game plans, and work together. The results have been wonderful, and this, like the other examples I gave, continues to this day. Uh, developing that coordinator position was an early gain. The electronic case management system, uh, I want to tell you a little bit more about that. It records information on all the clients, hundreds of them, who receive services from these over 50 programs. That means case plans, the goals for each client, all the services and benefits a client receives from any, any provider. And all staff without, throughout these agencies can review and look at this information. In part because that information has been so robust, robust there's really been a very effective no wrong door um, reality. Wherever you go, even if it's not the door that leads you to information for that client, that person will know where to send you. Well, we've looked at three, I think, very powerful examples of collaboration. You might be wondering, that's interesting, Russ, but how does it all come together? So this was one of the objectives I set out at the beginning. Six factors, these are not necessarily easy to put in place, but if you're looking for a way to kind of test yourself when you're beginning or in the middle of a collaboration, you might go back and look at these six and say, well, which two of these are working well and where do we need to step up? Let's go through them one at a time. A shared purpose that the parties can't achieve on their own. At the end of that's really important. If we can achieve it on their own, you know, it's often easier to do it ourselves. Do we have a shared purpose? That's another question. I could tell you embarrassing stories about groups I've seen struggle sometimes for months. They thought they wanted the same thing, but it turns out they didn't. They had different goals. It was a mess. They didn't even know it. So are we all here for the same purpose? Second, the parties want to meet now, and the last word is the most important one, now. That is, is it a priority for all the partners? You know, usually if you or a colleague of yours calls a meeting, people from different agencies, the person who calls the meeting, it's a priority for them. They've got to get something done. They're asking for help. But those who are brought to the table may or may not see it that way. They may have a lot of other items on their agenda. Can we find out how to make this a priority for everybody? The appropriate people are at the table. Many of the people I teach, managers throughout public and nonprofits, tell me that this is often the most important, sometimes one of the more difficult ones. What do I mean by appropriate? Well, people who have an interest in the topic, people who have something to contribute, skills, knowledge, background, resources, and people who will invest some time and effort, that is to say, people who will commit themselves. An open, credible process. Each of the examples we've given um, gave aspects of what that means. Is information being shared to all the stakeholders, like with the Early Childhood uh, Project? Do all the stakeholders have input? Are decisions made openly? You know, one of the quickest ways to kill a collaboration is for people to go off and, as, as we know, there's often a meeting after the meeting, right? Just like there's a meeting before the meeting. And sometimes people go off after a meeting and two or three of them get together and say, well, you know, I, this is decisions. It's very human. It's not necessarily a killer, but if people at the table don't know the two or three of us are thinking about doing something differently with this project, that can really ruin the trust. So those are all parts of an open, credible process. A champion for the initiative. We saw that with Joan Dempsey with the IADS example. She was a powerful champion. We often need someone senior like Joan Dempsey, but it takes more than a senior leader most of the time. It often takes a lot of champions among the participants, people who have a passion for the project, who may or may not be in a decision-making role, but who want to make it a priority, and importantly, who can influence their peers. Finally, and we've said it several times, and Bob, you asked a question about this, trust. And I know this has been brought up in a previous uh, conference um, presentation. We saw how important this was with the natural resources case where the supervisors at the line level had to work together. They had to trust each other. How can we build trusting relationships? This is a challenge, folks, among participants in the family readiness system. After all, most of the communications among you will be done the way we're talking today, via technology, face to, not face-to-face. Not, not face. 
it can be done. It was done with the IADS. It ha happens to take a lot of effort and it takes leaders who are committed to making the time to make it work. Well, now that we've talked about these six factors, and by the way, folks, in a moment, you're gonna have a chance to respond to a poll where you can reflect on the importance and usefulness of each of these. Where do we see these in that early childhood case? The shared goal that parties can achieve on their own, that was the reason it came together. That was one of the drivers of the collaboration. And the MOU, the Memo of Understanding, um, affirmed that. The parties want to meet now in the early childhood case, there were some who were laggards, some who were on the sidelines. They weren't sure they could trust some of the others. Not about bad people with bad intentions, not at all. They just weren't sure that a collaborative could work with all that sensitive information. It took a lot of the time. Appropriate people at the table. That was one of the strengths of the early childhood initiative. Those three leaders from the three key organizations, they were visible and they modeled collaboration by the way they worked together. That open, credible process. Well, I mentioned the memo of understanding and how important that was. The three leaders, though, had to model that openness, as I just said. They had to share information in front of others, inviting input from people, and sometimes making decisions based on the input from people. That gave people a sense that this really was open. A champion, I just talked about those three. They were extraordinary at being all in. When a couple of them had to leave, um, the S-curve started to flatten out. Remember our S-curve, it took a while, several years before they got some new chance of trust. Vital everywhere, vital in terms of sharing sensitive information. One of the things that the leaders of this project did that taught me something was they always made good on the promise. When they said they would do something, they did it. And if they, if they couldn't, even though they said they could, they would get back to people and let them know why they couldn't. So those are our six factors, Bob, to you. So we're gonna go ahead and open a poll for you here that, uh, that Russ would like you to respond to. And we'll just give a moment here for that to open up. So that should be open now. And uh, if you're not saying it, sometimes that can be hidden behind another window on your computer. Um, there's two questions in the poll. Which of these six factors do you think are uh, most important? And you can make multiple uh, selections there, as well as which factors do you think might be most difficult to achieve. And if you uh, don't see the second question or all the responses, please go ahead and scroll in that window or you can uh, expand that poll window by dragging the corner of that uh, window to make it a little bit bigger so you can see both questions. But why don't we go ahead and respond to that poll right now if you haven't already. Um, so I see, Nancy, you're not seeing the poll. Uh, Again, if you might, you might want to try to move windows around. Otherwise, it could be your pop-up blocker, um, and I'll let Coral and Carrie address that in the in the chat or with you directly. Um, apologies to those people who don't see the poll, but if you do see the poll, please go ahead and and respond now. Looks like we're having trouble getting responses. No, I think they're coming in. Oh. I think Coral's, we're just giving them some time okay, to great. make sure everybody can can come in. There, there's a question um, maybe that we could talk about while we're waiting for people to respond, Russ. Um, Victoria asked, how do you move a team forward into collaboration if you have a leader that wants to control every move so you're constantly reviewing and reporting? Yeah. Uh, control artists, as we say, can be incredibly difficult. Um, one of the things I've learned about people who have high needs for control is that they sometimes come across as very confident and all, you know, all knowing. And yet underneath sometimes that need for control really, really reflects uh, an insecurity. And so they kind of overcompensate. I'm trying not not trying to give you a lot of psychobabble, but they'll overcompensate by trying to control everything, including things they can't control. This is tough. 
I've known people who have gone up to such a leader between meetings, one-on-one, -on -one, to say, hey, Bill, Barbara, I know you really want this to work. I need to share with you that we can work much better if you can do more empowering. Um, some people are open to that, some aren't. Uh, another way to think about it is back to what you and I talked about earlier, Bob, the notion of relationships. See if anybody on the team has a, a decent relationship with that controlling leader. Because maybe the leader won't listen to most people, but maybe the leader will listen to someone in whom they have some confidence. Uh, and then when, if neither of those work and when the stakes are high, I've seen people do something that um, I know can be a test. Some people don't want to do what I'm about to say. But some people, because of the high stakes, because they're passionate about mission, will go to the leader's manager. And I once saw a colleague of mine do this, and he said, you know, I'm not comfortable doing this. I'm not a complainer. But I thought you, the manager's manager, would want to know that we're really struggling. And uh, the person was very professional about it. And in the case I'm thinking of, that actually did make a difference. Thanks for that, Russ. So I think we are ready to post uh, some of the results. If you didn't get a chance to respond to the poll because you didn't see it, uh, feel free uh, to respond in the chat as Jen did about which you think are most important and which you are think are most difficult. Uh, interestingly, it looks like, Russ, I hope you can see we those can, poll results. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that uh, we have sort of the same one for the most important and the most difficult. Trusting relationships, most important. Trusting relationships, most difficult. Wow. Yeah. And especially when you're not all working in the same organization. Uh, relationships take time. I mean, let's just think about it. Someone comes up and says, Bob, Anita, here's my card. You can trust me. I mean, give me a break, right? People have to show that they're trustworthy. We're going to get to relationships. I think we'll have time a little bit later. But one thing I can tell you is most relationships are built step by step small steps, thinking about something that might help someone, even if they didn't ask for it. Always being sure, as I said, about a different case to follow through and make good on your promise. Um, this is the glue, folks. This is the glue. And that's why I showed you in that S curve, when we have time, we don't always take time at the beginning to foster those relationships because we're going to need it when things get difficult. Uh, just one other word about the one, the second uh, most frequent getter in terms of the top question, which are most important, uh, a shared specific uh, purpose or goal. I once saw a, a group, as I mentioned before, struggle. They didn't know for several meetings that they didn't have the same goal. Here's how they learned about it. If you're ever in a group where you're not sure if we have the same goal, uh, don't wait. <laughs> you might do this fairly soon. After a few meetings, I realized the group I was talking about we were struggling, we didn't know why. So I had everybody write down on one little sheet of paper without their name, what did they think the goal was, the person to the group. There were 10 people in the group, we had six or seven different, different definitions of the target of the goal. <laughs> Imagine our surprise and uh, frustration. So the idea there is check in early. People need to hear things more than once. So I guess I should say that again, people need to hear things more than once. Reaffirm the goal, check and see if we're all on the same page. Um, there may be a lot of other questions, Bob. I'm sensing that we probably should move forward. Yeah, we can. We have some time for questions at the end. So let's okay. go ahead and move through. Great. Thanks for your help on that. And thank you all those who were able to, to vote. I'm sorry that it was a challenge. Folks, the last part of our webinar, in addition to questions and comments, what does it mean to be a collaborative leader? There's lots of models. I'll offer one to you. But first, let's just think about some role that all of us are familiar with and some of us, I'm sure, pay a lot of attention to, presidents of the United States. I'm a history buff. I love to read about and learn about presidents. So here's a mental test. I'm not asking you to text this in. Can you think of a president who by your definition, was collaborative in his or her, well, it's all his so far, all hims so far, a president who was collaborative in his leadership. My vote would go to two, Abraham Lincoln and Dwight Eisenhower. Lincoln listened to his cabinet, famously called a team of rivals. He made changes depending on their input. And Ike never let his ego get in the way. He was able to work with others who had huge egos, like General Patton, and Patton wasn't the only one, critical in the biggest role of his life, 
that is to say leadership of the D-Day invasion. So let's talk about collaborative leadership a little closer to home. And this has to do with something we all experienced uh, 2005, we saw it at least on TV, that, that horrendous Hurricane Katrina. It's an amazing story. Thad Allen, then a senior Coast Guard official, took over the rescue and recovery 11 days after Katrina hit. The media were having a field day playing up the governor, government's seeming total inability to do anything. FEMA's director had done a terrible job. He was yanked out. They brought in Thad Allen. There were problems all over the place. To put it shortly, it was a human, not only a natural disaster. What did, that, what did Thad Allen do? He started by calling, talk about trust. He started by calling some of his closest colleagues, asked them to join him, and they all said, sure. He was very open with the media. The media hadn't been getting candid answers from FEMA before. He invited the media to go wherever they want. He said that he would give them the good news and the bad, which of first responders, 15 or 16 organizations represented three or 400 people in the room. He listened to them. They had been just getting help from the media and they were retired and they were frustrated. He honored their efforts. He told them what the priorities were. He said, I'm not gonna micromanage you back to a previous question, Bob. He said, we're gonna play to your strengths. He learned what each of them was especially gifted at. He said, you're gonna do what you're great at. He said, I could micromanage you if I wanted to and I sure as heck don't want to, I don't have the time. And he had this remarkable, perhaps surprising mantra. He said, we're gonna give you all the information we can because he said, transparency of information breeds self-correcting behavior. Now, folks, to tell you the truth, that's often true, but it's sometimes not true. But Alan said it, and I think it was his way of expressing his confidence that these first responders would respond to changing needs, given that Alan was being open, giving them all the information he had. And that turned out to be true. And then this final quote, and then we'll talk about collaborative leadership more broadly. The one expectation he gave them besides to um, follow the priorities, treat every resident as if they're a member of your family. Now these first responders were exhausted. I said they were angry at being criticized. And here comes a leader they don't know, and he's talking to them and they're doing nothing but to save people. Treat everyone as if they're a family. And those people gave him a standing ovation and they continued to work their butts off because they had a leader who knew how to get them to work together. Ad Allen is really, uh, he's now a retired uh, federal official. He is one of the remarkable collaborative leaders our country has produced. And what did it do? Well, you can see what it did. They went from being a scapegoat, they went from having people laugh at them, they being the first responders, to what you see on the screen. Slowly, slowly people started to gain trust, started to gain confidence, realized that the feds knew what they were doing now. So let me put this um, into a framework, five collaborative leadership characteristics that I see over and over. And if we have time, in a couple of minutes, we're going to ask you to do a quick assessment. Ask yourself how you think you do on each of these. Great determination and resolve while keeping the ego in check. I already mentioned Ike, as well as Lincoln, by the way, and Ike's ability to control his ego. With Lincoln, he didn't hold grudges, didn't get upset even when people were criticized. Listening careful to understand others' perspectives. This is exactly what Joan Dempsey did in the IADS case. She knew that there was pushback, she knew there was, and listened carefully so that she could address them. Looking for win-win, not win-lose possibilities. It's easy to say win-win, it's not always easy to get it done. Our very first case, the Forest Service and BLM, they explicitly looked for changes that would help both agencies. One team had, um, let's say, an attorney that they could loan the other, and the other team had a techie that they could loan to the first. They were looking for ways that pragmatically helped each other. This is the one looking at this page that might not be obvious at first glance. Collaborative leaders use more pull than push. Push, folks, is using the authority of your position. It's telling people what to do. We'll always have that as part of managing and leading. Pull is less direct. Pull involves tapping something internal in people, their values, 
their motivations, their desire to do a bang up job. When Thad Allen made his comment about transparency of information leading to self-correcting behavior, as I said, that's not a given. I think he was using pull. He was tapping the first responders, responders' pride, their desire, despite their frustration and their exhaustion, their desire to save people, using pull as opposed to push. And a final comment on this one, when you use push, which is legitimate, we can often get compliance. When we use pull, however, we can get commitment. And as you know, there's a world of difference. And finally, thinking systemically and connecting to a higher purpose. When the early childhood initiative leaders tried to get members to go from my clients to our clients, one of the things the leaders did that worked very well was they kept saying to the staff, the people who are having a hard time letting go, what's the right thing to do for the client? What's the right thing to do for the client? And everybody knew what the answer was. It was for us to work together, to share our information. So that's thinking about a higher purpose. So I think we have uh, time for this uh, one more poll for you. If you have trouble seeing the poll, please just respond in the chat uh, to what you see on the slides. Which of these characteristics, and uh, you can select more than one if you'd like, uh, are our strengths for you uh, in collaborating and, and being a collaborative leader, and which uh, would you like to improve? And as you respond, uh, to those are a reminder that you can expand that window if you need to just by dragging the corner or you might need to just scroll in there if you're not seeing all the choices and, and questions. And again, if you're not seeing the seeing the poll, please just respond uh, in the chat to, to that question. We'll just give you uh, 30 seconds or so maybe to, to respond to that and we'll take a look at the at the responses shortly here. So as we're waiting for responses for us, Kim is asking, can you restate some examples of pull? Absolutely. Um, somebody comes up to you as a manager and says, hey, Bill, Barbara, I'm stumped. What do you think I should do? Uh, most of us, we like to help people, especially if we're in management roles. We can tell them what we think they ought to do. That's great. Paul might be to say, um, I've got some thoughts. Uh, what are you already thinking? Another example of Paul would be a manager going to someone who reports to that manager and says, or a group and says, team, uh, I've been given a really big assignment. My boss wants me to get this done. I can do it by myself, but I'd really love your input. And I'll let you know if I can use which of your ideas I can use. A third example of pull is to get to know people outside of work. Now this one has its limitations. Not everybody wants to share what they do at home. But when people in management roles especially take a special interest in how your kid's doing in your spouse's medical condition because they heard your spouse is having a hard time, et cetera, et cetera. Often, as you know, um, we'll go real far for that leader because they don't just see us as you know, a workhorse who has to produce. Um, my funniest example of poll is um, South Street Seaport in New York City. It opened in the 1980s, one of these classic examples of old wharves and, and buildings redone, spiffy, yuppie style, pricey items, you know, built for upper middle class folks. And two weeks before they opened South Street Seaport, the um, folks running the marketing for the company that opened it has New York City taxi drivers and their families and their families to come to a beer and pretzel bash. Now, you know, they would take money from those New York City taxi drivers if they wanted to go to South Street Seaport, but it really wasn't the target segment they were looking at. Why would they spend $20,000 on a group that probably wasn't going to spend money at South Street Seaport? Well, you know the answer. <laughs> Who wants to drive in New York, right? They had 6,000 little marketeers driving around telling people where they could go in New York City. So those are some those examples. Those are very helpful. Thanks, Russ. So we have the results up. And again, it looks like uh, the strengths uh, and the what they'd like to improve upon sort of overlap again here. Let's see. The one that um, they feel that they're strongest on is listening carefully. That's wonderful. 
of all of these, if we can be good listeners, that's that's and talk about building trust. That's fantastic. Um, and second, thinking systemically, that's also wonderful. That's not how most of my students grade themselves, so I'm really impressed. Which would you like to improve? The leading one is listening carefully, right? That's what you just said, Bob. Um, you know what, folks, I'm, I'm just going to make a quick comment here because I'm aware of the time. Listening is not a natural behavior for most people. For me, if I was speaking three times as fast. So you've got a lot of time <laughs> and our minds wander and you're wondering what's Russ doing and where are we going? And by the way, what's for dinner, right? There's lots of reasons why listening can be difficult. Here's one thought. Listening is about being nice, but it's more, not only more importantly being nice, it's about being smart. If we can learn what, where someone's coming from, that's good intelligence. It helps us learn how to approach that person, it helps us learn what's important to them. Helps us learn how to use pull, because with pull, as I said, it's tapping something internal, like a motive or a value. So think of listening not only as being a good person, but more importantly, perhaps, it's useful. It's in our interest to listen well. It can help us move forward. Bob, I could take a quick look at a few items on the trusting relationship slide, or we could finish it here. I know you need a few minutes. Yeah, why don't we kind of go to the to the wrap up, whatever you think uh, would be most helpful, and then we'll we'll go from there. Take a few questions too. I think we should go to questions. Awesome. So all these slides are available on the event page. So just a reminder of that. Uh, so let's take a couple of questions for you, Russ. Here, Gabriel. Gabriel was asking, how do you move a team forward when they all want credit for the outcome and nobody wants to be the worker bee? <laughs> if they all want credit, that's easy. We put everybody's name on the report, right? Nobody wants to do the work. I guess we'd have to go back and say, why are people on this team? Why are you here? If there's not going to be anything to take credit for, folks, if nobody puts in the work. Now, maybe they're not wanting to put in the work because, you know, you'd have to ask, why don't they want to put in the effort? Maybe it's because it looks overwhelming. And something we haven't talked about today is to take big projects and break them down into little chunks. And so we take one chunk at a time. But I would put it back on the team and saying, I'd love to get credit, too. There'll be no credit without the work. Where do we go, folks? Thanks. And from one of our YouTube live viewers, what are your ideas regarding staff that are performing at a high level and avoiding complacency? Staff who are already performing at a high level, I'm not sure what the complacency part means. That the staff are getting complacent? I think that's what the comment is referring to, yeah. Okay. Most of the people I know, not all, but most of the people I know who are high performers and from the comments I've seen today, Bob, I'm sure that that's a lot of people listening. Um, they love to learn. They love to get better. Uh, it may be ego. It may be natural curiosity. Most of the people I know who are high performers love to continue to learn. And so when I'm in a management role, I always am looking for opportunities for the real fast trackers to get even better, to broaden. Uh, to demonstrate something, write a paper, go to a conference, learn a new skill. People, most people love to learn. Well, Russ, I want to thank you so much for your presentation today. It was really uh, eye-opening and gave us a lot of tools that we can use to uh, you know, improve our collaboration and become collaborative leaders. So uh, thank you very much for your time today. I love being with this group, Bob. Thank you folks so much for being involved. And thank you, Bob and Anita and everybody else behind the scenes. And thanks to everyone for your, your comments and questions in the chat. Uh, please keep them coming as we learn from each other and answer each other questions uh, within our network. I want to remind you that we're offering several options for you to pursue continuing education credits as well as certificates of completion for your participation in this session today. Uh, for instructions, you can go to the Military Families Learning Network website. And I, I think Jen is going to post that link right now in the chat. It's uh, militaryfamilieslearningnetwork.org slash vc. 2019 slash credits. Detailed information on the types and number of credits available can be found on conference session pages as well. If this is your last session with us for the virtual conference, we invite you to provide feedback using our conference evaluation. A link to that evaluation can be found on that same web page. The evaluation should only be taken once, taken once so please make sure to wait until 
to take the evaluation until you've attended your last conference session. So only do the evaluation if this is your last conference session. If you're joining us for a micro, please wait and don't do that evaluation until uh, you have ended your conference experience. Thanks again to everybody. Uh, I hope that you'll join us for the Making Connections session. Eddie Menser uh, from the DOD Office of Military Family Readiness Policy will be joining me as we connect what we learned from Sonny Brown and Russ Linden to the Family Readiness System. Please join us at 2.30 p.m. Eastern. Until then, we're on a 30-minute break. I'll see you soon. Bob, are you still there?